Um, hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to uh, provide a little uh, summary of the uh, final analysis of the phase three tourmaline MMM1 study that we presented um, at the EHA meeting this year. And also, of course, have just published uh, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And the reason for this is obviously when you look at final overall survival, we really want to see what has the uh, combination of drugs that we've been studying achieved. And we're very pleased that the combination of exazomib, uh, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone in relapsed refractory disease had originally met um, its primary endpoint of progression free survival benefit. But the question was how did this impact in the longer term? Um, so it was a true privilege on behalf of my co-investigators to present this information. Just to remind everyone, this was a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial where we used the gold standard of lenalidomide and dexamethasone at the time in relapsed refractory disease and then added to it exazomib. But in order to be quite sure that we really were generating benefit, um, this was what we call placebo-controlled only for the exazomib. So patients definitely got lenalidomide and dexamethasone, which was the gold standard at the time. But if they were assigned to the three drug arm, they would get um, uh, the three drugs, exazomib, lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And what we'd shown was that there was a statistically significant improvement in progression free survival with the three drugs over the two. And this generated an approval from the FDA for the use of exazomib and relapsed refractory disease, which obviously has been particularly important in the era of the COVID pandemic because it provides a convenient uh, oral approach to treatment um, that minimizes clinic visits and yet can also confer obviously clinical benefit. So there was considerable interest around how did this impact with long follow-up on survival. Now this was a large international trial and we had enrolled 360 patients um, to the three drug arm and 362 patients to the placebo controlled arm um, we stratified, which means we just assigned to ensure balance patients by number of prior therapies, pre previous exposure to proteasome inhibition. Obviously, patients could not have been previously treated with lenalidomide because that would not have given them the benefit of the lenalidomide backbone in this setting. And at the same time, um, we also looked at a uh, degree of ISS staging uh, and overall survival in the intent to treat population was a key secondary endpoint. So um, with the median follow-up exceeding uh, 85 months, in fact, um, we were able to show really remarkable data. First and foremost, that the median overall survival was approaching 54 months for the three drugs. And amazingly, it was 52 months or approaching that for the two drugs. So both arms did very, very well. And what was interesting was that if you looked at the pre-specified analysis of patients with particularly high risk features, um, we were struck that clinical benefit actually was seen with the three drugs. But before I get to that, I really wanted to emphasize the conclusion of this analysis, which is that median overall survival values in both arms of this study were the longest reported to date in any phase three study involving lenalidomide and dexamethasone-based triplet therapy in relapsed or relapsed refractory myeloma uh, at the time of this analysis. So this is quite important because it really provides international confirmation of the type of gains in survival um, that we've been seeing. And certainly progression-free survival benefit clearly was statistically and clinically important for the three drugs, but that didn't translate into survival benefit. Now you might say, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it says many things. What it probably says is on the one hand, there are numerous exciting new salvage therapies, and that's very important. And we believe from our analysis that that had an important in impact because in fact, uh, more patients on the placebo-controlled arm received daratumumab-based therapy, for example, and that this imbalance in subsequent therapies may explain why um, the placebo arm did as well as it did. But in a sense, that's a good thing because it reflects the availability and excitement of new drugs. And on the other hand, it tells us from a clinical research point of view, we have to be careful how we think about this. We have to think about how we integrate this approach into study design as we seek regulatory approvals um, for exciting new drugs that could confer benefit um, to our patients. So that's important. But I think a nice positive from this trial that we did specify um, some specific subgroups, in particular high risk, and we were able to show clearly there that the three drugs over the two um, outperformed uh, the control, as it were, or rather than three drugs over the two um, were clearly better. Um, and at the same time, um, we were able to show that not just simply in high-risk cytogenetics, but in terms of refractoriness to prior therapy, 
uh, also at the same time, the high-risk study genetics included not only classical high-risk features um, such as 17P, but also newer ones um, such as uh, 1Q amplification. And finally, if you'd had more treatment than less previously, the three drugs perhaps not surprisingly um, performed better. And again, an important uh, subgroup in which benefit was seen um, were those who were older. In older patients, clearly this exazomid platform performed very well. So all things considered then, um, some important positive results that are practice informing um, from this trial. And I think the most exciting positive overall was these remarkably long survivals seen for the study in, in terms of both arms of the trial. So obviously very good news for patients.